good to share a little bit with you. I think when you when you think about voice technology, right? We and particularly in health, we're beginning to see ways that voice assists our lives. It automates by recognizing what we do. What I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit different. You know, we're we're used to thinking about AWS and systems, scaling voice assistance to tell us what we're saying, the automatic speech recognition. And it's interesting to kind of put it into perspective. This is a technology that has its roots as far back as the 1950s in the acoustic processing. But at the end of the day, it gives us the voice assistants that are automating and helping us with routine daily tasks. We all, I think, have experiences daily that tell us there's a lot more to speech than just the words. There's a lot more that we communicate than just what we say. And so moms are an example that I like to use. They're the original neural net. The one that I put up there happens to be mine. And so I know when I get on the phone with my mom within the first five seconds, even if I'm trying to hide it, she'll know, Jim, you haven't been sleeping enough, right? You sound like you have a cold. Are you tired? Are you taking care of yourself? Right? All the things that, that good moms will do. But as much as I want to discount that, what she's listening to is real. right? She's, she's sensing reproducible changes in voice that are reflecting involuntarily things about our underlying mental, physical health. And so what if we can take a step back and say, we can't bring those subjective measures into the clinical setting. We can't bring them into practice. But if we use signal processing and machine learning, can we replicate and extend what we're doing naturally? And that's really what we're talking about, is taking acoustic features and treating them like biomarkers, what I call vocal biomarkers. And so I'll tell you, and I'll pull it apart a little bit more, but at the end of the day, by collecting data sets that have the objective health labels and the voice change characteristics, we're able to create what features will allow voice assistants to respond to health underlying what you're saying. So let's, let's pull it apart a little bit. Why is voice a useful biomarker? And it has its roots in the fact that voice is the most complicated thing we do as humans. It requires most of our brain activating in very tight coordination with our muscles and our respiratory system. And what researchers and what San has seen over the last five to 10 years is over and over diseases that significantly impact the physiology of these major systems produce involuntary, often human imperceptible changes in the acoustic parameters in voice that you can correlate to those conditions. And so we do the signal processing and we will take a six second voice sample and we will divide it up into potentially thousands of different mathematical transformations. And so I give a few examples. You can group them loosely into prosody, which is the rhythm and melody of speech. So I vary my rhythm. I'm trying to change pitch a little bit because we're at the end of the day, we're kind of tired. So if I want to hold your interest, I communicate a lot through prosody. We use prosody to communicate a question versus a statement. So all of those things, really, you can break down into pitch variants, into things like uh, the, the phone durations. System is how we articulate, how we move our tongue, our soft palate, how much air we allow to go through our sinuses. That is us shaping the musical instrument that takes our source and turns it into speech. And when we have Parkinson's, when we have ALS, when we're depressed, the articulation changes. And so these features, multiceptral coefficients, uh, vocal tract coordination features, which we've developed, give you insight into quantitatively how these are changing. And finally, the source, it's really a reflection of how much of the air that you're putting through your vocal folds are being translated into acoustic energy. And you can look at the turbulent flow, how well the vocal folds are controlled, and that gives you a mix, often, of lung function and kind of your respiratory function and how consistent you are at providing airflow through that source. So now taking these, we can look at something like depressed speech. So on the top, this is, these are audio spectrograms. So as you go up, it's increasing in pitch or frequency. And as you go across, it's time. And so these are two different individuals counting from one to 10. And the bright lines are increased energy in a particular spectral band. And so what you pick up are those stacked bands, which are resonances that tell you a lot about the shape of your particular vocal tract. 
but their relationship to each other is what tells you how you're doing articulation. The bottom sample is from somebody who has very significant depression and probably is one of the few people that you would pick up on audibly as having flattened affect. They will often not change pitch. Their speech will be slower. And so we can quantify those things and look for the additional subtle features and combine those to look at can we predict, as well as the PHQ-9, as well as the HAMD, as well as other clinical instruments, whether or not somebody is at risk of depression? And the answer is yes. So we have, under IRB, asked thousands of volunteers to download software onto their own smartphones, which they've done. And it's self-guided. It walks them through a series of short vocal tasks. And we focus on very short tasks for, for a good strategic reason. The average length of the interactions that you have with Alexa, with Siri, with Google Assistant are typically four to eight words. And so in that short few seconds of time duration, if we want to tap into that growing stream of billions of voice transactions to get meaningful health monitoring information that can be passive, our technology has to work with those short samples. So the samples we've used in our research studies are people repeating pataka. It's called the Didoco kinetic task. So pataka, 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 pataka. And so you do that for five seconds. It gets people articulating. And there's that kind of effect when you repeat the same word over and over again, it kind of changes. So there's, there's different effects throughout even a short sample like that. Holding an ah vowel sound, which you may be familiar with the Empower app, one of the first research kit apps and something that they did for Parkinson's disease uh, and voice characteristics. But then short read sentences, more prompted natural speech to give us a sense, can we flow back and forth between these different speech regimes and get similar results? So the, the rock curve on the left is a, one of the better performing segments. So if we take a single device, and if we segment by gender, even looking across hundreds of people, never having heard them before, we get this kind of performance to predict which of those individuals would score 10 or higher on the PHQ-9 versus those who don't. So that's the standard clinical threshold that says you have enough symptoms over the past two weeks that you're at moderate to severe risk for depression. Um, to me, pretty striking early performance when we do it across all devices. The AUC is between 0.75 and 0.8, and we are now doing multi-stage models and including background references that are inc increasing the accuracy from there. But what's interesting to me as well is we look at depression, we call it by a single name, but no two individuals with depression have to have the same sub-symptoms. So how specific, how deep can you go there, there thankfully is a very small group out of the 4,000 people that volunteered who reported that they were bothered by thoughts that they would be better off dead nearly every day. And that's category four all the way to the right. And what we see is a handful of individual acoustic features that will vary in magnitude by up to fourfold only in the individuals that are answering at the most severe level for that. So these kinds of results are, are preliminary, not claiming that we have a a suicide detection machine, but they're, they're promising enough that it has stimulated collaborations with the world leaders, people like Matt Nock at Harvard, people at UP Med, UPenn Medical Center, that we're now taking forward in high-risk populations and trying to understand the performance of this. So to do that, you know, and this is where the, the work with AWS and our use of the platform comes in, we, we know that we need data at scale, so we've spent the time to engineer iOS and Android native apps that are built on top of a HIPAA compliant framework that send the data encrypted to the servers that we can configure multiple studies without reprogramming. So this, this code light sort of modification, we're running dozens of different protocols simultaneously in the same app configured in the back end, collecting different voice samples and different metadata, including clinical data on site. And then we also streamline the full pipeline, and I'll describe a little bit more uh, of that in a moment. And because we're on AWS, we can kind of replicate these on a partner-by-partner -partner basis, a region-by-region -region basis, so that we can conform to data sovereignty and to uh, institutional privacy concerns and, and manage this effectively. So to give you a little bit of insight, I'll use a case study. We have an engineering team that operates out of uh, Pune, India. I travel there frequently. So we've built relationships with seven hospitals in India. And just to step back for a minute, it's a, it's a very different healthcare environment and healthcare world. These hospitals, just one of them, will see several thousand outpatients in, in a day. 
And what we, what we do is we ask a technician to be there with the phone to guide them through uh, in their own language the voice samples to collect the PHQ-9, but also to collect medical record data. And so in that way, over the past year, we now have over 10,000 inpatient visits for a variety of conditions, all of them having in their own language, five, five languages represented, voice samples as well as the health metadata. And so because we have invested, we have the platform, we're now able to start crossing through these layers, beginning with are there vocal biomarkers across these different conditions? If they are, how well can they separate those individuals from the population? And then as a next level that we're just beginning to look at, how specific are they across major differences in disease or, or how specific can they be? And so when the voice data comes in, we have our own uh, signal processing code that extracts millisecond time frame, thousands of features, but it's also doing in tandem all of the pre-processing, looking at the areas of voice activity, looking for particular landmarks, normalizing and excluding based on quality, noise characteristics, et cetera, before we feed it into the model. And then we can apply our ML machine learning. We use Databricks. We use a variety of different systems to help us productize our, our, our data creation flow. And then we select just a few dozen features, typically, out of the thousands that most strongly correlate with a particular health condition. And if we use a label that is a change in a symptom or a change in respiratory status or something like a forced expiratory volume, we can get correlations that are what I call kind of nonspecific health change, detection and health tracking characteristics. Or with the PHQ-9, with diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, we can correlate directly with the, the other clinical measures. And so in that way, we do things like, can we separate individuals with congestive heart failure? That's the stated reason for their visit coming in that day. This is not separated by class or stage of heart failure. It's just, can we, as a group, differentiate based on voice alone the individuals who have heart failure from the rest of the age-matched uh, group in that uh, cohort? And so with this kind of 75% uh, performance, accuracy in terms of sensitivity and specificity to define these individuals, what it tells us is not that we have a product, not that we have something that's gonna change clinical practice, but it's telling us that the vocal biomarkers are actually pretty strong for a single phase model and that they give us an opportunity to go in and now begin to develop the longitudinal tracking measures that we can follow the change within an individual over time. We've done this in depression, we've done it in Parkinson's disease, and so once we see that the vocal biomarkers are there, we adapt and then we can create monitoring tools. So for me, what got me into voice, looking at all the possible signals that people shed that we might be able to pick up with sensors on devices that we have every day, was really the breadth, again, across these different systems. And so we've put together an initial list of 35. We would never be working on a pipeline this large if it wasn't for having the, um, <laughs> if it wasn't for having um, the, the parallelization and the, the standardization of the tools that we have on AWS. We've already collected human subject data in more than half of these 35 conditions. And in more than half of those, we've demonstrated initial models that are able to, with better than 70% accuracy, distinguish people with a minimum threshold of symptoms for that uh, condition from other individuals. And so Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, asthma, but also things, you know, and I think it's important that not every change in health, right, we're, we're in this system that right now presupposes you're sick before you engage in the care. I think where we want to go is can we measure changes in health that are prodromal or normal variations in health? And so we also have measures for things as straightforward as nasal congestion, for risk factors like sleepiness, how fatigued is somebody, not how long did you stay in bed, but how much are you impacted by it? Changes in voice coordination, so two to three alcoholic drinks within an hour produce very measurable changes in articulatory precision even when we're not noticing somebody that's falling over drunk and slurring, those are things that are much stronger than the changes in speech that we see in depression and are things that the models converge on very routinely. You start to then expand from there. And I think you begin to get a picture of here are a new class of inputs separate from linguistic input 
that can begin to provide context for interactions, that can begin to take the friction out of measuring health and to cue. So what we're not trying to do, and I think the word augmentation comes up a lot, I think these are ideal to augment a system, to give us cues which groups of the population are most likely to benefit from additional attention, additional screening. If we don't have the resources, and this is why in India, there's a particular kind of adoption hunger for this sort of technology, they recognize they may have six million people on average with depression in a particular region with only 100 psychiatrists to cover that need. They have to have tools, they have to have different ways of engaging and triaging, and I think this is a good first step in terms of connecting with other technologies that are, that are coming down the road. So what we have now, we focus on cued interactions. The question that we will often get very quickly, if it's going to be this powerful, if you're able to detect this much through the sound of the voice, I'm not sure I want that on my phone. I'm not sure I want it always listening to me, and I want to know, is the person across the table from me able to do it? So we start with a cued interaction where only the user of the phone, when you're using the app interface, is able to provide a voice sample to be monitored, but it now already takes the samples back to the server and in real time can give uh, the score for that measurement back to the phone. And that we have the ability to run based on individualized uh, uh, token control or, or uh, access control, the experiences in which measures a person can receive based on their registration and, and whether or not they have access to those measures. And it also supports um, a region and partner specific integration. So in the same way I was talking about the research side, you, you can roll out different measures, different sets, and importantly, it's not just about giving scores back. The, the point is trying to reduce friction in connecting people to a lot of the tools and a lot of the, the services that I've been hearing described over the course of the past two days based on a score, based on where you actually are. Instead of sending a timed alert saying you need to interact or you need to do this survey or you need to do this, it will send a health cued interaction saying now is the moment where you should engage with this activity. And I think better measurement, refinement, and improvement results. What we've seen is when we, in real time, can understand what is causing these measurements to be less accurate and report it back, we create continuous learning systems that are improving uh, the performance much faster. Um, and so from the queued, you know, what we're talking about in terms of providing these short samples, we have built the architecture anticipating a rapid evolution. Uh, from this queued to command modes where a user may be able to opt in to where each of the commands, because we're able to look at the short sample segments, can be logged. The relative health scores can be used just like you're tracking steps, just like you're tracking anything else, to look at the variation a across a range of health conditions over time in a longitudinal manner. And this becomes important. People tend to use these devices on average two and a half to five times per day if they're routine users. And that gives us multiple touch points now. If you look at the st statistics from things like Empower or the other studies, there is, for healthy individuals, for people, a rapid fall off in how often they will use these. So even when you want longitudinal data, you may only get a week or two from the vast majority of your, your individuals if you're lucky. With it becoming passive, I think you have much better opportunity to develop and learn. And finally, you know, we've established, because we're able to reduce, in most cases, to fewer than 20 different acoustic features, the computational requirements to do each individual voice measurement is on par with the buffering uh, size and the computation that it takes to recognize a keyword. So the technical feasibility to take wake to health function to always sensing mode exists. And I, this, is, this is the step that has to be taken if what you want is an alert. If you want to be able to detect when somebody's not interacting and engaging on the basis of their health, you have to be able to do this kind of function. And so the way you know, I try to, to position what we're doing is in the context of a 21st century thermometer. I would say that the clinical thermometer, it measures temperature, it doesn't diagnose, but it gives us a very valuable cue of when we should be engaging with the healthcare system. And over the last 150 years, it's been a very valuable tool. If we can allow 
devices that are distributed that many of us already have today to give us those thermometer-like functions as a platform and the ability as the technology extends to do clinical grade and regulated measurements. But I think we, we have uh, an interesting future that allows us to think about new ways for the voice interactions, for the other things that we, we do routinely to become a natural part of reducing friction from our, from our health decisions. And we're not alone, obviously, with HIPAA compliance now on Alexa, it, the number of articles just since uh, the beginning of April that are beginning, beginning to anticipate these types of uses for voice technology are, are incredible. You know, when we first started Sound Health, the Echo was in pilot mode. You had to have an invitation to buy it. And the world has changed dramatically since we started building the technology. And I think the time is rice, right to really think about new ways to put voice at the center of healthcare. So with that, I'll say thank you and uh, appreciate your time.